Welcome back to the Detect Crime series webinar presented by Serialize. In each episode, we examine one specific aspect of how crime series work with a little help from the excellent scholars of the Detect project, practitioners in the field, and our own Serialize instructors. In the previous episode, we started looking at the mobster drama. Shows like The Sopranos, Breaking Bad, Gamora and Peaky Blinders make the criminal the hero. We talked about the appeal of the bad guy to the viewers, the storytelling mechanisms for making us root for him, and the genre blend that borrows the relationship dynamic of the family soap for the mobster drama. However, whereas in the classic soap opera, the place where the show is set is almost immaterial, the mobster drama is all about the arena. The family may be the motivating factor for the protagonist to embark on a life of crime, but just as in a Shakespearean history play, what's at stake here is the empire. In a sense, the mobster drama works with two story engines. The first, as we discussed in the previous episode, is powered by the family drama. The safety and well-being of the hero's family drives many of its choices in the crime drama. On top of that, the relationships inside the family also generate their own dramatic situations and conflicts. The second story engine concerns the arena, and here we are talking specifically about the space in which our protagonists operate. That should not all be that surprising. After all, a lot of classic criminal activity is location-bound. Bootlegging, sex trafficking, gambling, or drug dealing is usually tied to a specific physical location, be it speakeasies, brothels, racing tracks, casinos, or your friendly neighborhood drug dealer on the street corner. This is precious territory because it represents, in economist terms, access to consumers, a market. And every producer wants to dominate his market outright. But they usually are competitors. So the hero and his family gang will fight over control of a territory with other gangs. And these guys know how to fight dirty. In Peaky Blinders, we're introduced to a world where Irish traveler clans coexist in an uneasy truce with Chinese and Italian immigrant gangs, communist activists, and the police in 1920s Birmingham. Our hero, Thomas Shelby, rattles that truce when he steals a crate of guns from the local factory and uses it as a bargaining chip to expand his power. Birmingham is an industrial and downright gritty place, and most of the people who live there are hard laborers, steel workers, and boatsmen and the like. But not the Shelbys. The Shelbys have shirked their humble beginnings and are now de facto bosses of the city in which they were raised. Tommy wants to knock off the main racetrack bookmaker in the region, Billy Kimber, to make the blinders the largest bookmaking operation around, and sets out an elaborate plan to enact this, beginning, of course, with stealing an enormous cache of machine guns, which are quite new and fancy and very hard to come by at this time, as well as a full lorry's worth of ammunition from the local BSA factory. In the Spanish show La Casa de Papel, Money Heist, the space that is being fought over is the Royal Mint of Spain. A group of eight pro bank robbers, led by the mysterious professor, invade the building, taking hostages and fight off the police lying in siege outside. What's at stake here is access to the printing machines, because the gang intends to print 2.4 billion euros in fresh, unmarked bills and escape with the loot. In the mobster drama, the control over spatial territory is intimately linked with economic power. But that's not the only thing that's at stake here. Because we're talking about drama, there's also the emotional element. Essentially, the question comes down to who is the boss? So conflicts over hierarchy, loyalty, trust, and betrayal come into play. That takes us back into familiar relationship drama territory, no pun intended. Here, the story engine of the family drama is crossed with a gang war story engine, since conflicts in the family over power and hierarchy can also turn into gang warfare. Sky Italia series Gomorra is about the fight inside a Camorra clan of a control of the drug business in Naples. After the aging mafia kingpin Pietro Savastano is put into police custody, a battle between two generational factions erupts. One faction is led by the old guard, the gang members who are still faithful to Pietro, and the other by his son Gennaro and his younger recruits. Soon, spiraling out of control, this civil war keeps raging on through subsequent seasons, devouring more and more characters in its wake as other clans are pulled into the fighting. Characters move in and out of the storytelling 
and protagonists change. Serialized instructor Nicola Luzuadi calls Gamora an arena-driven show because the desire for control of the arena drives the storytelling. You are in a kingdom that is called Scampia. It's a kingdom and you enter the war from the point of view of di different landlords that are competing to rule over this kingdom. The arena is a kingdom that several landlords will want to lay claim to. But what does this kingdom actually look like? The text scholar Luca Barra notes that Gomorrah has become part of a recent wave of Italian mobster dramas that portray very specific areas or regions in Italy. Sky Italia series Romanzo Criminale, which ran for two seasons from 2008 to 2010, Gomorrah, and Netflix's Subura, launched in 2017, now in its third season. Yeah, with, uh, with this kind of, uh, of crime narratives, there's a strong issue uh, related to re the representation of the characters, uh, of, uh, uh, of the habits of the common people in a way, and also of a specific location. Uh, with Romanzo Criminale, we have a very much criminal Rome. Uh, with uh, Gomorra, uh, we uh, see uh, Scampia and uh, all the Neapolitan Metropolitan region uh, invested a lot by, by Camorra, but also with the later production as Suburra, once again, we see the peripheries in, in Rome, uh, not in a wonderful light, as well as several mafia crime dramas, which are very recent, uh, are portraying uh, in a kind of uh, um, complex way uh, the Sicilian region and several other uh, portions of, of Italy as uh, uh, crossed a lot by these criminal uh, gangs uh, and, uh, and so on. These shows put a lot of emphasis on the specificity of the setting and its representation. The TV series Gomorrah was based on the non-fiction book of the same name by Roberto Saviano, published in 2006. The book describes the criminal activities of the Camorra mafia organization in Naples. Those activities were concentrated on the Scampia neighborhood a public housing project erected in the northern suburbs of Naples in the 1960s and 1970s. The show makes use of original locations to convey a sense of authenticity. It also employs a Neapolitan dialect that is difficult to understand even for Italians who are not from the region. The text scholar Federico Pagello notes that this was a very deliberate choice by the broadcaster. I mean, I watch, like most Italians, we watch Gomorrah with subtitles. And that is not a problem. I mean, first of all, it's not real Neapolitan. It's a mix of uh, real Neapolitan and some softer version of it. So we can get the gist of what they're saying. But uh, we need subtitles to understand a lot of what they're saying. That clearly didn't um, reduce the appeal. Probably actually work in favor of the fascination of the series. I'm not talking about authenticity, just talking about the. It's another aesthetic element that contributes to reinforce the atmosphere, the coherence of this world, the, the sound and images, the kind of feelings that the sound and the images gives you of being immersed in this uh, very in this world that is very different from ours. We know though that uh, producer like HBO has asked have asked Italian um, producer of TV series to keep uh, dialect in some of their series because they think it's a good uh, mark of probably quality, maybe authenticity, um, I don't know, but that's, that's a fact. And clearly for writers, again, I think that uh, trying to combine some elements, most, as many elements as they can from actual real specific social and cultural linguistic settings, um, to do that is definitely a good thing for, to create a more, believable world and characters that look not real in the sense that, that they come from reality, but real as uh, 
fictional, complex fictional um, people. <laughs> Federico notes that this presents screenwriters with a very important decision that goes beyond mere narrative choices. Where uh, a crime narrative is set is crucial for both the creative fictional reasons, but also for production reasons and for the advertising reasons that choosing a particular location and using well, using well it in the script, in the narrative has been proven to be key to the success to some of these stories like Gomorrah or Romanzo Criminale for Rome and Suburra. So we should note that the specificity of the setting and how it's represented aesthetically add to the appeal of a series. Clearly broadcasters nowadays are much more open to distinguishing their shows through such representational strategies. Screenwriters should therefore be clear on how they want to realize the physical depiction of the arena. What do we see and hear on the screen? How can that make us feel part of the world of the show? But even if broadcasters are now more adventurous when it comes to portraying certain crime-ridden areas, other quarters are not that sanguine. Luca Barra calls it a double-faced representation. On the one hand, of course, there is this idea of a bad representation uh, of, uh, of the locations, of the people. Uh, we are not like that. Uh, we are not all like that. Of course, there are uh, aesthetic reasons, narrative reasons, uh, in order to create something which is fictional, even if uh, uh, roughly based on reality, on actual crime stories and uh, and so on uh, so so there has been um, kind of a, a strong debate every time there are always local authorities which are very much uh, negative towards this kind of representation this kind of image that is given of Italy across Italy but this is kind of taken for granted in a way uh, and a lot also abroad in the world uh, in across Europe and and across the entire globe and uh, which is kind of I think what it makes that more problematic for for local authorities the idea of the world is watching uh, Italy and specific uh, cities and specific regions of Italy in in a specific way on the other hand the fact that the world is watching also means increased attention on these particular regions that may otherwise have gone unnoticed in mainstream media uh, because uh, this kind of uh, uh, crime uh, dramatization uh, is also appealing, uh, is all, brings also a specific aesthetics, uh, even a specific coolness in a way. Uh, and so actually at the same time, some local authorities uh, are complaining about the representations, other local authorities are actually giving funding and money uh, to bring the production on their, uh, on their territories uh, uh, because of course that's a way to make people work in the territories but also because it's a way of getting a, a, a relevant spotlight uh, on the national and on the global stage. Um, there is uh, um, television induced tourism. Uh, there is uh, um, more generally, uh, a, a, this is also a way to know better several peripheral locations that otherwise are probably not so much considered in the national imagery and in the imagery of Italy that can globally travel. So here we see the close interaction between fiction and reality. Here the fictional representation of crime can have a real-life impact on our understanding of certain places and people. This becomes even more significant when we consider the origin stories of many mobster dramas. It probably shouldn't come as a surprise that some local authorities are skeptical about certain crime dramas. For the depiction of state representatives in the mobster drama is often less than flattering. Whereas in detective drama, the police are portrayed as a functioning apparatus that returns justice to the world, in the mobster drama, they're often part of the problem. Often the local police and politicians are just as corrupt or at the very least complicit with the criminals. In season one of Peaky Blinders, Police Inspector Campbell is more interested in hunting down communist revolutionaries. 
He has no qualms about making deals with Thomas Shelby, a known bookmaker, until he realizes that Tommy and he vie for the affection of the same woman. In season two, Campbell returns, now out on a personal vendetta against Tommy, and utilizes police operations for his personal aims of eliminating this romantic rival. Peaky Blinders makes the argument that organized crime arises in those areas where state authorities are weak or non-existent. The Shelby's or criminal organization arises out of a situation in which the criminal bosses provide important social services to their neighborhood. Those under the protection are given jobs and kept safe from attacks from other gangs, and the most needy are provided with food, housing, and rudimentary health care. It's a way to take care of their own and, incidentally, to build support among the population for the gang's activities. But it also hints at the historical origins of many of the traditional mafia organizations in many countries that sprung up as impromptu social networks that took over the care of its local citizenry in regions that state authorities neglected or could not penetrate. Peaky Blinders is a mesmerizing concoction of some historical events and a lot of creative imagination. In contrast, Romanzo Criminale, Gomorra, and Sabura are based on investigative books on crime organizations and portray, in very thin disguise, real-life events in recent Italian history. Because the choice of uh, gangs, they're particularly real ones, <laughs> real criminals, is a very fascinating way to explore uh, aspects of society, how Italian society, the, the underclass, the underground of our society, uh, somehow struggles and find ways that are not legal, but uh, find ways to move up in the society. And by doing that, they help us understand how how business is done in many parts of the countries and how the state and the law relates to organized crime. And organized crime, not only in Italian history, is a big part of the history of the country. In this way, the arena encompasses not only the specific geographic setting of the show, but also the social, political, and legal framework, or the lack thereof, that structures society at large. The mobster drama thus becomes a way to examine a country's own origin story, or at the very least, offer an alternative history from the official state-sanctioned version taught in textbooks. This is another argument for screenwriters to research their arenas very carefully. How can the space become a battleground? How should it be represented? And what does your show say about the community you're trying to portray and its origins? In addition to this webinar, we're also organizing a contest for new original series ideas for either broadcast or streaming services. The proposed show should challenge and push the genre in un unexpected ways and use crime narratives to explore the richness and complexity of European societies. An international jury of top professionals from the broadcast and streaming industries will review the top five submissions. The winning author or team of authors will be invited to attend the DETECT final conference in Rome in June 2021 and meet the members of the jury. You can go to the link in the show notes of this episode to find out more about this contest.